On today's Transport Evolved, gas guzzling tax credits return, a final revisit to 2014, and we preview the CES 2015 show. These stories and more coming up next on Transport Evolved. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to episode number 224 of Transport Evolved, recorded on Sunday, January 4th, 2015. Happy New Year! My name is Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, and I'm your usual host into the world of evolved transport. And as we like to say at Transport Evolved, that's any kind of transport which is cleaner, greener, safer, or smarter. Uh, we've got two fantastic guests joining us for the new year, two regulars of Transport Transport Evolved, two gentlemen who really do know their stuff in the world of future cars and plug-in vehicles, safe autonomous drive technologies. The list goes on and on. Uh, and without further ado, joining us from, I don't know if it's sunny New York, I didn't ask him, I'll ask him now, the fantastic John Volker, uh, editor of Green Car Reports and uh, often found on other sites as well. Good hey, afternoon, hey. John, how are you? Happy New Year. I'm Happy good. New Year Happy to New you. Year. Uh, is it nice weather in New York at this time of year? No, it's grim and gray and rather raw. It's New York. <laughs> Get out of my way. Spend more money. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That that makes <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, and uh, it's it's kind of the calm before the storm for you, isn't it, John? At the moment, there's uh, a busy calendar uh, for the automotive writer in January. Yes, I have a whole slew of air, airline trips coming up to go to the Detroit Auto Show, where we know the 2016 Volt will be uh, unveiled, and some other green cars as well, and then a number of drive events and previews before and after. Excellent. I look forward to hearing and reading all about those experiences uh, on Green Car Reports and other sites. You do also cover uh, mainstream cars occasionally for the rest of the High Gear group. I do, the car connection and .com in particular. Fantastic. And uh, joining someone, uh, joining me uh, all the way from the other side of the new, uh, of, of the new, of the US, the other side of the US to New York, uh, the fantastic Tom Saxton. He's Plug in America's chief science officer uh, and uh, northern part of the US, but the wrong coast to Mr. Volker there, Tom. Hey, Nikki. How are you going? How's it going? Happy New Year. How are you today? Uh, I'm great. Good, yeah. good, good. And um, what have you been up to of late? Well, getting ready for National Drive Electric Week. And uh, Kathy and I are pretty active with the uh, high school robotics program, and that's uh, in full swing now. So that's taken some of our time. Cool. I have to ask, are there any high school students who built a robotic car yet? Uh, actually, one of the students that came up through the the first robotics program now is uh, works at Tesla. Wow. Mm. There is a good, uh, that's a good career progression. That's a very yep. good career progression. Yep. Excellent. Well, um, we've got a very cram packed show today. Uh, we've got lots of things uh, that we want to talk about. Obviously, start of the new year, new sheet effectively for the automotive industry. Uh, as John was saying a few seconds ago, great number of auto shows and drive events coming up. Uh, for the automotive journalists, but also obviously for the car fan. Um, and we've got lots to cover today. But before we uh, kind of deal with any of those, I want to chat to John about uh, an article that he uh, wrote um, last week, or one of his colleagues wrote at Green Car Reports, but also, John, a kind of a, a, a year in review. Some of your most popular uh, articles of 2014 here at Transport Evolved, we might think that it would be uh, cars that are uh, plug-in hybrids or maybe hydrogen fuel cells or all electric vehicles. But actually, as it turned out, uh, Green Car Report's most popular articles of 2014 were in fact to do with trucks. Uh, I was blown away by that. Well, you know, it's interesting. In thinking about it some more, Green Car Reports, which is now uh, <clears throat> almost six years old, 
has been growing steadily from a base that was effectively zero. We now have many, many hundreds of thousands of people reading us each month. We're approaching a fairly large, uh, consistent readership level. And I think really what's happened is that it's somewhat normalized to the car market as a whole in the U.S. The most popular vehicles, as we've discussed before on this show, in the U.S. are full-size pickup trucks. They sell, their models sell more, <coughs> sorry, than any other passenger cars. And uh, those buyers really want to save fuel too, perhaps less now that gasoline's $2 a gallon in uh, some parts of the country. But um, when we do an article on fuel economy in full-size pickup trucks, two things happen. First, the article gets a ton of traffic uh, from people who are essentially Googling fuel economy pickup truck. And the second thing that happens is that a small number of our readers go ballistic and say, how dare you put full-size pickup trucks on the site? No one needs a full-size pickup truck. You should only be doing cars that fit the following criteria. And then there are a variety of criteria, be it you know, 30 miles a gallon or only small cars or only plug-in cars or only all-fuel cars or whatever. Um, as we've explained, including in an article on uh, why we write about full-size pickup trucks, we want to try to help people get educated about greener alternatives in every segment and ignoring the biggest segments in the market we don't think would be all that smart, but it does cause a certain amount of ruckus uh, <laughs> among our readers. Actually, the imagine. single <laughs> popular story was the one about the very aerodynamic and extremely striking looking uh, airflow bullet truck prototype. And I think that was based on, wow, I don't know what that is, but I have to click on that photo. <laughs> well, I think it's also uh, fair to say, John, that the way, and, and, and again, I don't know how popular I'll be saying this, but the way that the majority of our goods and, 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 and groceries are delivered whether it's in the US or, or Europe, is by uh, large semi-trucks or 18-wheelers or whatever you want to call them. And if we can make those cars, or those trucks, sorry, cleaner and greener and save fuel in the haulage part of the process, then the price that we pay as consumers will stay low. And that is uh, something that I think we overlook uh, in the consumer market. I think that's true. And certainly upping the fuel economy of a semi from two miles a gallon to three miles a gallon is an enormous savings. It's a savings of 50% on your fuel bill, or a third. But, um, you know, I think most car buyers and even people who follow cars out of, out of an interest and a passion don't really think so much about that piece of the transport system, in part because there are simply far fewer trucks than there are private cars. And also, in general, we don't tend to know very much about those vehicles. It's why the fuel economy standards for heavy trucks that have been passed over the last few years are going to be enormously important, but they didn't get a fraction of the attention or the political shrieking and moaning and pissing that fuel economy standards for cars got. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting one, and I think this year it's going to continue, and we're going to see what the the impact of that is the question really john is will consumers see the net effect of that will those cost savings be swept up elsewhere i think um transport's a small part of the price any smart merchant is trying to drive cost out across all parts of the value chain all the time which is why you um if i put on my political domestically manufactured hat, which is why you get some quality stuff imported from halfway around the world in some cases. However, um, people want low prices. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the price of oil varies so enormously that right now I'm expecting to see sales of diesel vehicles decline as a portion of the passenger car market simply because diesel fuel has fallen far less in this country then has gasoline, which is down 40% in six months, which is just astounding. And so people are going to say, oh, gas is cheap. I can buy a bigger car. I can buy a truck instead of a passenger car. And I don't need to pay the extra few thousand dollars for the diesel. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, as I say pretty much every time I come on your show, um, retail car buyers overweight 
initial purchase price and underweight total cost of ownership. But there's also some argument that barring an external geopolitical event, gasoline prices may stay low for a while. We'll mm. see. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, there's talking about gasoline prices, uh, which is something that you know you've you've segued very nicely into the next talking point. And I know Tom, this is something that you want to talk about as well on today's show. Uh, we are now seeing gas prices in the UK dropping to to around uh, one pound ten per liter, which is kind of the lowest it's been for a very long time. Certain parts of the US, John, well below three dollars a gallon now. Well below two dollars. Well a below two dollars a gallon. Sorry. Yeah. Um, exactly. And uh, there is some worry, uh, and we talked a little bit about this last week on the show. There is some worry that these super super low gasoline prices is going to disincentivize people from buying greener, more fuel efficient cars and plug in vehicles. Now, um, John, I don't know if you've looked yet at the at the sales figures for, for last month. I don't know if you've managed to, to wrap up the sales figures for 2014 yet. They come out tomorrow, actually. Right. OK. So a uh, little plug, uh, greencarreports.com. Uh, I think the best coverage for, for sales figures uh, of, of, of any of the sites. Um, and I can say that because A, we don't do them and B, uh, you're my former editor. So I, I, I have a bit of an alliance there. <laughs> Thank you kindly, ma'am. Uh, but Tom, do you, are you worried about these gas prices? Uh, I'm not. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is an electric vehicle, driving an electric vehicle is uh, the cost equivalent of buying gas for about a dollar a gallon. So, yeah, it's great that gas has dropped from $4 a gallon to $2 a gallon, but you can cut it in half again by driving an electric vehicle. And well, I that's think that, a nice way of putting it. The, you know, the owners out there that are telling their friends how awesome the electric vehicles are are also telling them about the convenience of being able to charge at home and also the complete lack of concern about electric rates you know, doubling in a couple of months' time, which we see that happen with oil. So uh, I think all the advantages of electric vehicles, they're, they're, you know, more fun to drive and more convenient to fuel and less expensive to operate. Those are still true even in a world where gasoline is $2 a gallon. Right. And, and Tom, I feel like I should put in a plug for Plug In America's recent blog post, um, which looked at four years of sales of plug-in cars and found zero correlation between rising or falling gas prices and those sales. Yeah. Yeah, we were pretty surprised by that result. We were looking at it wondering, you know, we hear that all the time. The media assumes that, that lowering the gas price is going to kill EV sales. And we decided to look at that. And we were quite surprised to see that there really is no correlation. And uh, we appreciate you uh, uh, putting a link to that article in one of your stories. It's, I like uh, data. Data is data is king, as I was saying to someone earlier on today. Uh, information information allows you to make the, the sensible choice. Um, all right. Um, so uh, I'm just uh, moving on here. Uh, Tom, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the uh, 2014 was the year in which we started to see autonomous drive demonstration vehicles really become something that mainstream car companies were really starting to push. Um, Previously to that, I was looking up the other day, Google, believe it or not, uh, started its self-driving car projects back in 2010, I believe, 2009, 2010. I can't believe it was that long ago. Um, but but last year, we really started to see some of the mainstream manufacturers really push uh, autonomous drive technologies, whether it was fully autonomous driving uh, publicity stunts, as we saw with... Uh, with uh, with the the driving around the the, the Hockenheim ring with uh, Audi, or whether it was something a little bit more uh, reserved, we definitely saw a lot of these vehicles uh, coming into the market. But do you think this is the year that we're starting to see self driving vehicles entering the mainstream market? Not necessarily completely autonomous, but but having the functionality uh, for safety purposes. So so John, um, things like lane keep assist. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et That's what I'm talking about. So, uh, Tom, I'd like your your views on that. Well, I think it's going to be a continuation of the slow evolution that we've seen, where you know we start getting things like parking assist and then automated parking, the lane change detection and the lane change assist. I think we'll continue to see 
those features slowly come in at the high end and trickle down to uh, you know more median priced cars i don't think we're going to see a sudden jump from you know today's cars to a, a car that'll drive you to work while you read the newspaper right right uh and john i mean the publicity stunt we saw last year from audi was pretty spectacular wasn't it the hockenheim ring a7 but it wasn't as it first appeared uh on paper well there's sort of two ways to approach autonomy one is a car that simply looks around whatever it's got and processes that in real time and the other one is where it compares to a pre-existing map um, the google approach is largely the latter they use their google street view and a whole bunch of other uh, data that they merge together to give the car a sense of what it's passing through that isn't entirely reliant on uh, processing a whole bunch of images uh, in radar and vision and so forth. Um, these are tremendously complicated questions. They are the subject of a great deal of discussion in the automotive media, let alone amongst auto engineers. And I sense that there's an emerging conclusion that we will see, as Tom said, a lot of sort of specific task functions, um, the lane keeping and uh, Cadillac is going to come out with something called Super Cruise, which is lane centering, which lets you take your hands off the wheel as well as your feet off the pedals under cruise control on freeways. Um, and maybe automated parking and things like this, but full 100% autonomy, get in the car, tell it to take me to so-and-so, is quite a long way away, um, is the sense I get. Um, but, you know, part of it's going to be the car company saying, what are the things that people will pay for? You know, right. uh, the example I use, and Nikki, you're a mom, so right. um, imagine that last moment trip to the stores or to the mall with two young children, one of whom has a bad cold, while it's raining or snowing, you spend a certain amount of time driving around the parking lot or trying to find a parking space that isn't a quarter of a mile away from your store. Right. Imagine driving up to the store, taking the kids out of the car, going inside, pressing a button on your fob, and your car goes away and parks itself. Right. And then you beep it again to come and pick you up. That's something that people will pay I think a lot of money for right. those parents who want that in the same way that people pay for a lot of sort of child friendly and family friendly features and minivans and so on. So we'll start to see these sort of solving particular problem kinds of autonomy, probably a decade or two before full universal autonomy. Right. And we're going to be seeing a demonstration of exactly that functionality at, at CES 2015. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the show, right. but BMW is, is going to demonstrate exactly that. And, and I think you're quite right. I mean, there are features that parents will pay for. And also there are features that uh, busy uh, executives will pay for. So, of course, we expect to see these kind of features in higher end vehicles first. And I think we'll see uh, uh, technology benefiting driving in other ways as well. I, I just read an article that the EU is... Uh, looking at removing the requirement to having physical side mirrors and allowing them to be replaced with cameras. And that enables some pretty exciting things like a, a rear view mirror that makes your car transparent so that yes. when you look out the rear view mirror, you can see a toddler standing behind your car. And I think that's going to also be a tremendous improvement in safety without taking us all the way to robot driving. Right. Although it must be said that I do hope, and I know it's something that automakers are really pushing for in the, the US, the idea of replacing the lowly rear view camera, uh, sorry, rear view mirror with a rear view camera, but placing that rear view image on a monitor that's shaped like a rear view mirror up by the driver. And I have to say, as a parent of two preteens, uh, having the mirror is essential as a mirror because I can see what the children are up to in the back seat. And if it's just a video feed from outside the car, they could be doing any manner of things and I wouldn't be able to tell. Um, uh, if I recall the announcement that Tom referred to, and I'm forgetting at the moment which automaker it was that showed it on a concept, allows you to flip back to a conventional mirror. I believe, John, it was uh, Honda, uh, not Honda, Toyota. Hmm. 
I, I want to say Toyota. I've certainly seen a Toyota with something, but I know we know that Land Rover, right. Jaguar are also working on this pillarless technology, right. which kind of does away with the A pillars and the B pillars and replaces that with an image from outside the, the vehicle or, in, in fact, for an SUV, uh, allows you to see the crest of the hill that you're climbing up in your four-wheel drive off-road vehicle uh, so that you don't bottom the vehicle out on a rut or whatever. Um there is uh, one other thing that I wanted to, to talk to your, your personal experience uh, about today, Tom, and, and kind of this is kind of the pre the pre meat uh, of the show uh, is your experiences with the Nissan Leaf. Now you've had a Nissan Leaf for how many years? Uh, we got it September two thousand eleven, so it's been a little over three years. Right. And as Plug in America's chief science officer, you've done some fantastic work cataloging and tracking and recording uh, the data that John loves so much uh, of, of car uh, battery degradation and reliability of Nissan Leafs as well as other cars as well. You did a fantastic one uh, with a Tesla Model S and Tesla Roadster. Um, but you've said uh, that you've noticed uh, this, this year for the first time that when you're doing a longer distance trip in your Nissan Leaf, you've started to notice the effects of battery degradation. But the car itself doesn't seem to show any signs of that on its internal dashboard. Since some of our readers may not know about what this is, uh, what what battery degradation means or, or how to spot it, I think it's really good that uh, you're here to share with us um, what that feels like in the real world. Yeah, you know, we still have all 12 capacity bars. So just looking at our instrument panel, you'd think our, our battery is still the same as new, but we, we've lost... Uh, almost enough to lose that first capacity bar. So, yeah, the lack of, of great instrumentation makes, uh, you know, using and, and planning use for the car more challenging. And you've been, previously, you've been charging your vehicle to an 80% charge, which you can do on the early Leafs um, and to, to obviously try and extend the battery life. Um, but now you're saying that you're having to charge it to 100% to still be able to make trips that you did a couple of years ago. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the uh, the capacity loss that we've experienced combined with uh, really cold weather a couple of weeks ago, where we were down uh, below f a few degrees below zero, which in I'm sorry, below freezing, which uh, increases our energy use. The combined of those two made a trip that we've done many times on an 80% charge, not quite work on an 80% charge. Right. Uh, luckily, we were aware of the issue and. And there was a, a charging station in the parking garage we right. were at. So that was very handy. Very lucky. And of course, those in the Pacific Northwest have been having a really cold, some cold weather of it uh, lately. And, and the whole US is starting to, to I believe, you're, you're just about to have another dreaded polar vortex. I don't know if, if that's correct. Yep, that's, that's, that's happening. We're getting raining and flooding and freezing, I'll predict it here in Washington. So if you had to offer advice to people who are buying a plug-in car for the first time, uh, kind of five or maybe just two tips that uh, would help them extend their range. Uh, do you have anything that you, you, could, you could give in, in, a, in sort of 30 seconds? Well, uh, the obvious thing is to use seat heaters rather than cabin heaters and uh, preheat your vehicle before you leave. That, that makes a big difference. Excellent. Uh, yep. Uh, John, do you have any, any tips to add? To that i'm sort of caught catching you off guard there i do apologize no it's you know tom essentially took what i was going to say um preconditioning is huge and i think it's something that people in the more temperate californian climates may not use as much as those of us who live in the snow belt but uh, for those who aren't familiar this is essentially while your car is still plugged in 15 to 30 minutes beforehand um, use your phone app and tell the car, right, I want my cabin to be 71 degrees or whatever. Um, this uses energy from the grid to do that, not energy from your battery pack. Right. And so you start out with more of a full charge than you would if you got into a cold car uh, that had a full battery pack and then not only use the battery energy for transport, but also for heating or commensurately for cooling if you're right. in a very hot place. Um, and yes, seat heaters, um, <clears throat> I've always thought that all electric cars ought to have not only heated seats, but a heated steering wheel as well. Um, but, uh, it turns out that your mind is tricked. And if your backside and your hands are warm, it thinks that you're warmer than the rest of you actually is. Right. 
Right. It's my feet that get most cold in a car in the winter. I must admit, it's my feet. Um, thick socks. Thick socks. I do have thick socks on right now. And in fact, for Christmas, I think I was awarded with four or five different sets of thick woolly socks by you various too. family mm -hmm. members. Me too. <laughs> I must be getting to that age. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, the, the kind of a bit of a, uh, a plug here. Um, our Electric Girl columnist, Pamela Thwaite, wrote a very excellent article yesterday on, on preconditioning. So uh, do check that out as well. All right. We've got, an, we've got a couple of uh, final stories for the segment. And these are a, a kind of a revisit, or at least one of them is, um, because Tom's on today uh just uh, in fact it was christmas day uh, tesla ceo ceo elon musk announced the long awaited 400 mile battery <laughs> upgrade for the tesla roadster it's not just a battery upgrade it's some tweaks to the aerodynamics uh, an aerodynamic kit but also some uh, improvements to the tires and the brakes to decrease rolling resistance and improve efficiency uh now Last week on the show, we had Chelsea Sexton on and we discussed, uh, you know, this is something of a publicity stunt on Tesla's part. It's not really going to make any money out of this. Uh, there were only 2,600 Tesla Roadsters ever made. I'm not sure how many of them still survive today, uh, but if we assume that a small percentage of Tesla Roadster owners are actually going to take up Tesla on this uh, upgrade option, uh, it's not going to be something that's going to make the balance sheet look all that impressive. But I would like your opinion, Tom, on, on the benefits and the merits of it. And maybe then, John, we can talk about uh, it being a very cunning publicity uh, stunt from Tesla and what Tesla really stands to gain from this all. Tom. Yeah, so back in the days before the, while we were waiting for the Roadster to come out, when we all had our deposits in, you know, Tesla told us that by the time we needed to replace our battery pack, that battery technology would have improved enough that... Uh, cheaper, lighter, more powerful battery packs would be possible. So I think it's, it's awesome that Tesla is actually coming through and delivering on that. And I think it's a benefit not only to Roadster owners, but I think it tells Model S owners that, 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 you know, that there's at least a chance that Tesla will continue to support them five or ten years from now when it's you know, Model 3 that's selling it. 10 or 20 times the rate that the Model S did. So I think it's it's great to show people that electric vehicles can get uh, better over time, which is not something that happens with gas cars. Right. I understand the, I understand where you're coming from with that. So do you think um, that, that, that Tesla almost had to make good on its promise because it was one of the hooks that it used back in the original day to get people to buy the car? Well, it's even more than that because back in the day they offered a plan where you could give them twelve thousand right, dollars and that would buy you a new battery pack seven years later, and so they had a a very specific obligation to do that. Right. And that you know I think it's very nice that they're coming out with a battery pack that's better than the original pack and it's going to be available to people who didn't make that pre-purchase. Right. Right. John. Uh, you smiled when I talked about publicity stunt. Well, Tesla um, and specifically CEO Elon Musk uh, at this point get a huge amount of publicity for almost anything uh, that they do. But I think, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> this is going to allow Tesla to do is claim that it offers a 400 mile electric car. And it will be worded in such a way that they're not actually saying, we will sell you a 400 electric mile electric car tomorrow. But when you get the sort of, oh, you know, electric cars can only ever go 250 miles or whatever, this, this is another arrow in their quiver to say, look, not only are we continuously refining our cars, we're the only car maker to do this, you can pay us a chunk of money and get you know, better performance, longer range, more efficiency and so forth, but in fact, we promised that one day we'd have a 400-mile electric car. Now we have it. And then, as you guys said, look what that would seem to indicate down the road for the Model S and Model X. But it's, it's very clever. It's very, very clever. And uh, we, something we'll, we'll come back to later on in the show today. Uh, 
I think it's a, it's a topic about Tesla and Elon Musk and the way that the company's being run and maybe some thoughts for 2015. Final story of the segment, and this is one for you, John. Um, back, uh, it, it caused much, <laughs> much wailing and gnashing of teeth amongst environmentalists. Uh, news that the federal government uh, has snuck back in a tax credit uh, which was reduced for the last previous tax year, but is now up to its uh, high, high $500,000 level. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it, John, and the impact <laughs> that, that it may have uh, on uh, sales of fuel-efficient vehicles. Um, this is a tax credit for owners of small businesses who buy what back in the day were considered to be industrial or farming or sort of um, commercial vehicles, which were defined as anything over 6,000 um, <clears> pounds. <throat> now with heavier cars um, and larger cars and faster trucks and so forth, you can buy quite a number of passenger vehicles in this country that weigh more than three tons. And if you do that, um, and you are a small business owner of certain types, instead of amortizing the cost of that equipment, over a set number of years, as in the tax code, you can amortize the whole thing the first year. You don't end up paying less tax, you just end up getting the credit sooner. And back in the day, that was known as the Hummer credit, because what it allowed was a lot of uh, sole practitioners, accountants or doctors or whatever, to buy a Hummer for their business as their business transport and deduct the entire cost immediately uh, instead of amortizing it. Whereas deducting the cost of a Prius that would carry that same single person on his or her rounds would not have been deductible in the same way. It had to be amortized. Um, for the 2014 tax year, this had been cut down to $50,000 of immediate amortization. And in the horse trading and sausage making, that is <laughs> a negotiation at end of year budget reconciliation packages, the credit got put back to where it was. Frankly, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but it was a hot button, especially when aggressive testosteronal Hummers uh, <laughs> were available for purchase new. Now, instead of an aggressive testosteronal Hummer, you can buy a marginally less aggressive, marginally less testosteronal 6,000 pound Chevy Suburban. Right. And you can make it roll coal if you put the right engine in it uh, as well. Not that we would advise such things, but obviously it's a lot of the pickup trucks that, that are covered. Uh, it's worth interest, worth noting, of course, that Ford, the F-150 pickup truck, which is the most uh, popular pickup truck in the US, uh, the, the high-end spec model, the kind of the uh, fully kitted out uh, with the, the, the highest towing capacity and, and load carrying capacity, uh, does fall uh over six thousand pounds on the scales uh, but in general ford is working really hard to make its f-150 pickup truck a lot greener and i think maybe it's fair that we give ford a bit of its dues there it's really worked very hard there's even a rumor john that i've heard floating around that it might be working on a plug-in hybrid version well how do you rate that ford and toyota had um a deal to work on hybrid pickup trucks together which was summarily ended by Ford, oh, I don't know, 18 months ago or something like that. And um, supposedly each of the two makers is now working separately on hybrid pickup trucks. Um, one of the big questions between now and 2025 is what proportion of plugins every maker is going to have to make to make the 54.5 mile a gallon 2025 cafe average, right. which is about 42 miles a gallon on the window sticker, and how much they can get simply by improving the fuel efficiency using much more conventional means, smaller engines, turbocharged engines, multi-speed automatic transmissions, light weighting, Ford in particular, more aerodynamic vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's really sort of the equation that will determine how many plugins they think they need to make and sell, absent those handful of companies that really clearly do see a long-term market in volume plugins, into which category I would probably put Nissan, General Motors, and BMW right now. Right. Plus Tesla, of course. But and it's going to be—it's going to be interesting. Uh, of the uh, of the the Hummer credit, 
uh, as people are still calling it. Some people were saying that they're, they're just waiting for Tesla to come along with a six thousand pound vehicle with some <laughs> extra batteries in it. Uh, I do wonder how long it will be before Elon Musk uh, figures that one out. And that would Tesla... help the battery pack, though. But we'll see how much the Model X weighs because remember, I, I you know I've said it before. I think Tesla is probably having some challenges right now getting decent range numbers on the Model X. It is taller, heavier, and has a bigger frontal cross section plus all wheel drive. And I think in order to get, I mean, they have to offer it with a minimum of 200 miles range. My suspicion is that car may end up um, being a challenge to get good range numbers compared to its Model S counterpart. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where you might see the bigger battery pack first. And it's an interesting thing to note, John uh, and and Tom, that the 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 Tesla Model S and the Model X generally has worked by by brute force. Bigger batteries, bigger motors gives you the longer range. BMW, on the other hand, has worked a very different tack, which is very lightweight construction. Uh, battery packs actually smaller than some of its competitors and very narrow wheels, very aerodynamic vehicle. From a from a scientific point of view, I've got to give BMW the edge on this. I've got to give BMW the kudos because ultimately that's a more sustainable future, Tom. Uh, yeah, I wonder how well that appeals to their uh, mainstream buyers. I mean, that strikes me that, you know, the i3 is an awesome vehicle. Lots of people love it, but I wonder if it's really... I think it's one of those, those, it's a conquest car that's attracting buyers from other makers rather than uh, offering a, a vehicle to their traditional buyers. So, yeah, is that a sustainable way to grow your, your product line? I'm not sure. Hmm. I should also point out here, BMW, and we wrote about this, but I don't think it got the attention it deserved. BMW showed a prototype of their next generation of plug-in hybrid. They're going to have some plug-in hybrids that come out starting this year in various vehicle lines, but this is the next one beyond that. They call it Power E-Drive, and they have very smartly said, you know what? For a plug-in hybrid, you really want to operate in electricity as much as possible. It's more toward the range extended end, um, but not with quite as minimal a range extender as the BMW i3 Rex. They say that this plug-in hybrid system, which has an electric motor driving the rear wheels, as your sort of default powertrain for your first 60 miles or so. And then another electric motor with a small gasoline engine up front as your range extender slash all wheel drive slash, you know, plug in hybrid. Um, they say two thirds of all the miles covered by all the cars they sell can be driven electrically using that system. Yes. So I, that system they showed in a five series GT, but the, Discussion in the industry is that BMW will introduce a 5 Series sedan when that vehicle is renewed in a couple of years with the Power E-Drive powertrain that functionally, for half to two-thirds of its miles, is an entirely electric car, just as the Volt does sort of two-thirds of its miles in electric-only mode. And that, I think, will appeal very much to its traditional customers. And that is a really nice uh, springboard on which we can jump into part two of the show. Uh, so stay, hold, uh, stank, uh, hang hold, stay tight, or whatever you want to do, we will be right back. Now, normally at this point in the show, uh, traditionally we'd have a call for donations, as those of you who've been watching and listening to the show of recent weeks will know, we can no longer do that due to some changes in tax law in Europe. Uh, but what we are looking for is some new partner sponsors to join us on the show. So if you're interested, please do get in touch. Show at transportevolved.com. And if you're a regular listener who just wants to spread the word and support us in other ways, please do use the social media links, the sharing links at the bottom of every story on the Transport Evolved website. Uh, tweet about us and send, uh, send readers our way because more readers it's a good thing for us. Uh, we're into part two now. We've got the fantastic John Wog from Green Car Reports and Tom Saxton uh, from Plug in America. And we're uh, the first segment was very long, uh, but we are, are now going into kind of our smaller segments now. And before the break, John, you were talking about BMW's plug in strategy and uh, how BMW is, is planning to make a large number of its vehicles plug in hybrids or, or offer plug-in capability to customers in the future. And uh, I, 
brought this story up this week. Uh, it's been around a while. We only covered it this week. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, rumoured to be developing an in-house electric car programme. Uh, that should be distinct and separate from the uh, B-Class electric drive, which was built with Tesla's help, and also the Smart for Two e-drive, which was built with Tesla's help. Um, but, John, uh, this seems to be the new... Uh, standard in the automotive world we're now seeing mainstream automakers specifically high-end uh, uh, high ticket automakers building electric vehicles or planning to have an electric vehicle program in order to compete directly against tesla yeah tesla it's hard to understate how much tesla startled the germans um really german luxury cars now for a quarter of a century arguably considerably more have been the high-end prestige, luxury and sporting sedans. And to have a company like Tesla come along and in 10 years produce a car that's as sexy, faster, and far more advanced tech than what any of them had was really, really, really a shock. And um, they don't like to be outcompeted. But the particularly interesting thing about Mercedes-Benz is that it was by far the least committed to electrification. Mm. VW Group has said they're going to have plug-in hybrids on every volume vehicle, as well as a, an undetermined number of battery electrics, yes. mostly based on their existing platforms. BMW, of course, is the furthest ahead of the three. Daimler lagged behind. The street didn't understand what their electrification strategy was. At one point, they had deals with four different battery companies. They were jobbing out the development to Tesla and so forth. Um, they have a, ch a partnership in China, China to do a special electric car over there, et cetera, et cetera. It was a mess. Yeah. Now we learn that to be produced in their German heartland will be a new supposedly dedicated platform for battery electric vehicles and perhaps range extended electric cars that will spawn two sedans and two SUVs, a large one in each category, a medium sized one in each category that are meant to be their Tesla competitors between 2019 and 2021. That is a remarkable commitment of capital mm -hmm. and an indication that in fact, they're taking it very, very seriously. Now, I have a little a, a little bit of a question regarding that. Um, and, and that's primarily that, that Tesla for, for many years has set itself up as the car company that's, that's different, the car company that's made electric vehicles successful produced longer distance electric vehicles, high end, high performance uh, vehicles. And now we've got all of these mainstream automakers coming on board, which arguably can do everything that Tesla's done and more uh, because they've got far more capital. They've got far more uh, th there's more of them. They're, they're the big elephants or the big gorillas in the room. And Tesla's the, the very small chihuahua in the corner. Now, I'm not obviously saying that that Tesla's no good or you know incapable but these mainstream automakers uh, John are far more capable aren't they of, of doing anything that Tesla can do in a lot less time and a lot less um, I don't know about less time um, they have far greater development resources and capital yes but those get deployed in multi-generation seven and 15 year product plans that are based on a set of assumptions. And five years ago, Tesla being where it is today was not written into anyone's assumptions. And so just as they have enormous resources, they're also a little bit like ocean liners. There's a lot of momentum and changing direction suddenly is a big challenge and requires a fair, fair bit of disruption. Um, Tesla is quite quick to respond. It is. And need it. Um, and I'll tell you a little story about that. I went on the launch event for the RAV4 EV, the Tesla powertrain in a Toyota crossover utility vehicle that is Toyota's compliance car, now largely wound up. Um, that, was, that was developed in starting in 2011, I think, or was it, two, I forget the years now. Anyway, they had members of the Tesla part of the team and members of the Toyota part of the team on that event. And it was utterly clear that they spoke different languages and came from different planets, if not solar systems. <laughs> and the anecdote was that some test had not gone quite 
the <laughs> way as expected. I don't know if it was a structural, there was too much structural vibration or something. And the Toyota approach was to write up a full description of the problem, spend a week analyzing, detailing, and <laughs> refining the problem, submit it up the chain to the engineering staff to have decisions discussed and go down. And the Tesla approach was, all right, well, these two guys will develop a brace and we'll test it tomorrow morning and see if that solves the problem. And both <laughs> sides didn't know who was crazy and who was smart. <laughs> they both learned a lot from each other, but Tesla, as a Silicon Valley company, even in a, an industry with much longer product cycles, Tesla can, in fact, react fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the question, I think, on all of these German competitors is, are they targeting today's Tesla lineup or the Tesla lineup of 2016, which has a Model S and a Model X, or are they targeting where Tesla thinks it's going to be in 2020? That's a really tough question for them to answer. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you provided the logic to my, um, uh, to my devil's advocate hat at that point. But I'm going to keep my devil's advocate hat on uh, for a second. And uh, I'm going to direct this one to Tom. Tom, uh, you know, if everybody and their dog is producing 200 to 300 mile plug-in vehicles, you know, you've got your choice of price, you've got your choice of range, you've got your choice of features. What is Tesla's USP going to be? Tesla's made its name for doing things differently. It's made its name for having uh, upgradable cars that, you, that, that upgrade themselves over the air after you've driven them from the Tesla showroom. What is Tesla's motive going to be when everybody else is producing a plug-in car? Because Elon Musk's always said what he really wants is everyone driving electric cars. Yeah, well, I think I think what John just said makes a lot of sense. That uh, uh, car companies that are aiming to be where Tesla is today in five or ten years, Tesla doesn't hold still. They keep surprising us with uh, enhancements to their vehicles on a fairly amazingly short time scale. Just think of all the features that they've added to Model S since it came out. And they don't, they don't wait a year to do it. It's like, oh, we now have this feature or that feature. Let's put it in the car now. And uh, I think that's a very disruptive approach to the automotive industry. And I think that as long as they stay driven the way they are now, they will, they will continue to innovate ahead of the competitors. So, you know, other than the, the automakers that are in the game now and gaining the experience, you know, anybody other than, Chevy and, or uh, GM and Nissan and, and now BMW, uh, you know, all the other automakers are working, I think, at a, at a pretty serious disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And I just want to apologize to you there for a second, Tom. I've just realized while you were talking uh, that your lower third still said Chelsea Sexton on it. So I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I have well, it's just... just, it's just it's just one letter different in the last name. Yes, so. I do apologize though. I've just realized somebody will watch the YouTube video and they will <laughs> they will they will create all kinds of manner of fuss. But I've now fixed it. This is what happens when you're trying to run the show yourself. You've got a camera and to my to my defense, the bit with the lower third on is obscured by the camera that I'm currently looking at. So I hope you'll forgive me. All right. Moving on. Um we've had uh, a, a, a large number of, of discussions coming up um, about uh, running vehicles on, uh, sorry, running houses on vehicle battery packs. Now, uh, we've had vehicle to grid where electric cars can provide backup power to the grid. Um, and John, we've talked about that quite a lot on the show when you've been on before. Uh, and I was smiling when I was setting the show notes up today because I realized we're doing it again. Uh, but this one is very slightly different. This is a system called V to H, vehicle to home. It's very popular in Japan. Um, it was around before the tsunami of 2011, that devastating tsunami and earthquake. Uh, but um, it really became popular. After that point, the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid has now been approved to use that system. It's the first plug-in hybrid to be approved for that system. Um, my question, John, is are we ever going to see this backup emergency power solution ever make it to the US? We think about California, we think about Oregon, we think about Washington. Right on the ring of fire, we've got um, lots of places in 
the US where this system could be used. Why haven't we adopted it yet? Well, I think it's important to uh, recognize that the Japanese, while this concept had been around, got a firsthand and fairly vicious demonstration of the need for distributed power sources after the earthquake and tsunami. Um, there were quite a lot of Mitsubishi iMeads, which became essentially portable power sources for not so much homes, but hospitals and first aid tents and EMS providers and so forth. Um, that experience has caused the Japanese industry in concert with the government. And I don't know, honestly, if this is being mandated. I think I had heard it is. But for any vehicle that has onboard storage of battery or other forms of clean power, um, I think Japanese makers are going to be required to have power out capability built into these cars as standard. And I say that in particular because when I drove the Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, it too had a Chatamo out in the trunk, very similar to the Outlanders system. Um, and the Leaf has that as well. Uh, Nissan has shown the sort of Leaf to home right. converter box where you take the DC and convert it to AC. Mm -hmm. The challenge in the US is that every household uses about three times as much power per day <laughs> it does. or it does. energy per day as a Japanese household. But I, 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 it obviously it varies according to region, doesn't it? In terms of consumption, I mean, if you're if you're in the Midwest, you're going to use more power than those of us in small Manhattan apartments. No, we don't use so much power. <laughs> but um, it would also be hard to get an iMeve up to the eighth floor. But it is true. <laughs> uh, um, but to answer your question, I don't see any current push amongst U.S. emergency planners to require such a capability in battery electric or fuel cell vehicles, uh, in part because emergency planning in the states is largely a state matter, not a federal matter, whereas cars are regulated at a federal level. That makes total sense. That makes total sense. But um, Tom, you live in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we've, we've heard... Uh, uh, we've heard reports that the, the, the two plates are jammed together in the Pacific Northwest and the area should ready itself for a massive earthquake at some point. Um, Chadamo is a rather complex system, uh, but can you see it catching on this 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 vehicle to home emergency backup solution, or do we think that something else will take its place? As John was saying, American consumers do use a lot of power. Yeah, so actually, we you know apart from the earthquake threat, we on a pretty regular basis get winter storms, winter wind storms that uh, take out our power. You know, we've had uh, a wind storm in the winter that left us without power for over a week with the temperature in the you know twenties outside, and uh, we have a natural gas backup generator in our house that switches you know automatically when we lose the grid power. Uh, we have a transfer switch. The, natural gas generator comes on and I would, you know, obviously love, love, love to be able to have our, our leaf or our roadster power the house for a few days when we have these power outages. So, and there's definitely lots of people you hear about in the Northwest who want that same thing. So, you know, maybe consumer demand will get that, will get that rolling even if that doesn't happen at the top from emergency planning. Hmm. And I think the challenge there is that um, there's probably some layer of federal regulation that at best regulates power out and at worst uh, <laughs> prohibits it. Yes. And I, I think the challenge is going to be how do consumers, Tom, find out about that in the first place? How does an electric car buyer say, I want my electric car to do this thing? Well, one thing is that there's a lot of, you know, do-it-yourself work that's being done with this. We have people that are uh, turning on their leaf so that the traction battery charges their 12-volt and then using their 12-volt system to run an inverter to keep their fridge going during an extended power out. And, you know, of more sophisticated approaches where people are tapping in to the traction battery directly and doing their own inverters. So I think people are expressing their interest in that by doing it themselves. And hopefully we'll have. All? I'm sorry. Do you have any data on that? You know, is it 
you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands? Uh, I don't, and I suspect the number is pretty small. Yeah, yeah. But it definitely gets a lot of attention online. People talking about it. Yes, and and it's worth also noting that there's a there's a guy in in Europe, I believe he's in Norway who, um, as we talked about on the show last week, because Norway's incentives are so good, uh, insurance companies are writing off cars that generally really shouldn't be written off because while the cars are uh, subject to these these fantastic incentives, replacement parts are not. So it ends up, you know, something relatively simple breaks on the car and then you're left with a massive repair bill and your insurance company goes, actually, it's cheaper just to buy you a new car. So as a consequence, there are quite large numbers of wrecked or breaking Nissan Leafs and other plug-in cars. Um, this one particular guy bought a wrecked Nissan Leaf battery pack. The battery pack was perfectly OK, took it apart and put it in a server cabinet in his home. Uh, using an emer- a, a German designed um, power management system can now use his home uh, during the day. He charges his house from solar panels. Um, any excess power goes into the battery pack at night time. He can use the battery pack to give him power or he can pull power in from the grid when it's cheaper and feed it back during the day. It's a very, very complex but very elegant solution uh, using electric car battery packs as a second life. Now, obviously, we haven't seen that anywhere else in the world yet because the economics don't make sense yet. But it'd be very interesting to see moving forwards. Um, uh, of course, there is a challenge, John, for the Mitsubishi Outlander, which is that it doesn't it isn't on sale in the US yet. Um, and this particular vehicle, I should probably note the vehicle to home system, it doesn't work with a gasoline engine uh, when plugged into a Chatamo station. So when the car is plugged in, it will only work on battery power. It will deplete its battery pack and you can recharge it using the gasoline engine, but you'd have to go outside, unplug your car, turn the engine on, charge it back up and then carry on. Do we think this plug-in hybrid will ever make it to the US, John? Oh, I think it will eventually. They At uh, last fall's Paris show, they showed the updated version as a lightly disguised concept. That's the one that will probably arrive as a 2016 model in the U.S. this year. Mitsubishi North America very much wants it. Um, They've had a few regulatory glitches of their own with California, but um, it gives them something else to talk about uh, and a very high dollar uh, vehicle. I think I think the challenge from Mitsubishi is that they're not a particularly prestigious manufacturer in this country. Um, They are often described as perennially challenged Mitsubishi here. And getting someone who may be considering a BMW X5 plug-in hybrid or Mercedes-Benz ML plug-in hybrid to cross shop the Mitsubishi showroom that's peddling a bunch of heavily uh, subsidized cars to uh, buyers with not very good credit is a, is a bit of a challenge. Hmm. Uh, so we'll. I think they have some challenges above and beyond the car, but yes, I do think it will come here, and it will come here with rather better styling <laughs> than uh, the current version of which there's a photo in your program notes. Yes. And hopefully a little more, um, a little less wishy-washy in terms of its feel. It's a very good car. It's good fun to drive, but it does feel just a little bit... <sighs> It's not as exciting as some SUVs to drive. Uh, It does have all-wheel drive. It does have the eco mode. It's got this fantastic paddle shifter so you can control the regenerative braking. Uh, But generally, I can understand why it needs a bit of an update for the US. Um, I hope it keeps the Chatamo quick charge port because that's one of the nicest features about it. You 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 have 20 miles of EV only range and then you can use a Chatamo quick charge port uh, charging station to, to top it up. It's worth noting, of course, that even though it only has a 12 kilowatt hour battery pack, it still takes about half an hour to charge up to 80% because instead of using the 40 or 50 kilowatts that the Leaf does at, at start, this car is, is limited to about uh, about half that, so about 25 kilowatts maximum charge current to obviously protect the battery pack. All right, final story of the segment. Um, John, It's uh, the NAIS coming up soon, the North American International Auto Show in Detroit. You are going. Uh, The Chevrolet Volt being, I suspect, probably the most important car being unveiled there this year. Can we have some... For for our crowd. Yes. Can we have some some predictions, please? Uh, Maybe a a recapitulation of what we already know about it. 
Sure. Um, details on the Volt will begin to uh, be known. Uh, well, they'll be released to the public probably one week from midnight tonight. Um, if GM follows its usual embargo rules, uh, and they may leak out before that. Um, the Volt will remain a five-door hatchback. It will be completely restyled. It will be built on a new platform. And we already know that the battery pack will have slightly more capacity, although they won't say how much, that it will have slightly greater range, although they haven't said how much yet and probably won't for till closer to its on-sale date in the third quarter of this year. And um, it is almost certainly designed for higher volumes and more importantly, to be less expensive for GM to build. To me, the biggest question, aside from the various packages and ratings and so forth, is going to be the price. Right. Um, uh, this is my turn to pitch an article on Green Car Reports that I just wrote this morning, looking at an article in Forbes that asked, is the Volt a mass market electric car? And should it be? Because uh, Chevrolet's chief marketing officer, Tim Mahoney, has made some comments that said, you know, this is not a mass market car. It is bought by a very specific set of people who love it, who have, find it enormously satisfying, who rate it very well. But look, we don't sell these cars in Oklahoma or North Dakota. We sell them in California. We sell them in the Pacific Northwest. We sell them in New England and the Northeast. You know, this is not a car that applies universally across the country. That's reflected by four years of sales data, whether or not GM should put the effort into it to sell it across the country is really the issue at stake. But to me, the most important issue is what's the thing gonna be priced at? Right, right now, the Volt is at $35,000 base price, and most of them go out the door between that and 40. That said, they're starting to discount the Volt on run out, and I have been told that you can get them before incentives for under $30,000 at some, right. in some regions. Um, but what will they price the new one at? Will it be priced at $29,995, which gets it below the average transaction price of the average car sold in the U.S., which is $30,000 and change, right. and hence makes it something that more people will look at? The problem is, of course, you still have to rely on your dealership to explain what it is, what it does, how it works, why a 40 or 50 mile electric range is really all you need, and then you can go forever, et cetera, et cetera, yes. the usual yes. dealer. I expect it. I'm going to be really, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting You're gonna to be proven wrong. Numbers, aren't you? I'm going to say 25 base, base model. I think Chevy's going to do a base model at 25 and then a high end model towards 35. I think they have said there are not going to be two pack sizes. Ah, interesting. You do know that. They, they did say when they released some of the info on the powertrain, which has um, both of its motors now can generate or can power the car. So it's a little bit more like a two motor hybrid system uh, than the previous Volt, which had one electric motor turning the wheels and the other one being purely a generator. But um, it also has this larger 1.5 liter four cylinder range extender, so it's not quite as strained under high demand. But at the event where they talked about that, they said, no, 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 there's only one pack size, there's only one power, you know, we're not doing versions. What might happen is there could be a very stripped down version, rather like the fleet Toyota Prius that you can't actually buy unless you're a fleet, that has enormous amounts of stuff deleted. Hmm. I, I wait to see what the price is going to be. I, I don't have anything to say to that, but I, I am curious to see if Tom, what Tom thinks the price is going to be, and if if the new Volt will have what it takes to take the edge off the Nissan Leaf, which seems to be running away with all the sales right now. Yeah, I'm curious to know if we know whether it'll be a five passenger vehicle. Um, Jim has been very cagey about that. Clearly, they know that that is something that many buyers say is extremely important. If I had to bet, I would say that there's probably some provision for a fifth person, but that person probably ain't gonna be real comfortable. 
They right, were even just a T-shaped battery pack. Yeah, so, I was going to say the T-shaped battery pack yeah. remains, so yeah, so that okay. that causes some problems there. Yeah, and that makes it a hard sell with families with uh, car seats too. So it does, and then I think that's one of the reasons why the Leafs proven so popular is because it's just got the five seats. It, you can get three child seats in the back if you have the right type of child seat, and you know, and you. I I'm highly skeptical that U.S. families with three children riding in child seats by compact four or five door vehicles. You are probably right with the major in the majority of those cases, John, but I mean it, it might be as a second vehicle. I have seen some. I don't have any data to suggest how many, but I've certainly seen some videos again, it's it's the Pacific Northwest, it's California, it's the Northeast. I gotta think the vault will be able to fit two child seats. And you know, yeah, they may sacrifice a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of their market, but I don't think that's a big sales consideration. It's more the, okay, I've got my kid and three of her friends, and we're just taking them from <laughs> A to B. Friend number three has to have a seatbelt. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's come straight back. We're going to have a quick ad break, and then we'll be on to the final segment of the show. Do you enjoy the show? Do you like wearing fun and unique clothes that support the things you love? Then you're going to want to head over to www.transportevolved.com forward slash shop where you can show support of Transport Evolved by buying one of our fabulous Transport Evolved branded apparel. We've got everything from hoodies and t-shirts to water bottles, badges and tote bags and they'll be sent direct from our partners at Spreadshirt to your home address in double quick time. What's more, by buying something from our shop, you'll be sending us a little kickback as a thanks for our hard work on the show. And you'll get something unique and fun, and we'll get some warm, fuzzy feelings knowing we can continue to bring you a great show every week. What's not to love? And we're back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that little, uh, little ad break there. I just realised... We're having a bad day for the lower thirds. It's not the the twenty eighth of December, twenty fourteen. It is in fact January the the fourth, twenty fifteen. And I do make these lower thirds up before the show. And today, for some reason, there was persistence. The old lower thirds prevailed. I don't have anybody to to change that for me. So we'll just have to carry on as we were. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Tom Saxton from Plug in America with us today and also uh, editor of Green Car Reports, Mr. John Volker. We are on to our final segment of the show today um, and we're now going to be talking about Google's self-driving cars. Now, Tom, you're something of a robotics expert uh, and Google uh, has been testing and prototyping and developing self-driving software for cars for a number of years it initially started with the toyota prius um, and then it moved to some lexus suvs uh, earlier last year i believe it was may we saw what i can politely call a bubble car uh, it's kind of a low speed neighborhood electric vehicle with intelligence uh, which google said it was going to build going to build a fleet of a hundred of them for testing in the US and it's now said this month will be the start of that testing. I'm curious to see what you as a uh, robotics expert really think of this tiny little bubble that doesn't look anything really like a conventional car. Do we think it's going to be taken seriously? Do we think it's going to be a hit? And do we think it's actually ever going to take off or be just one of Google's myriad of developmental projects that never goes anywhere? Yeah, that, that car is pretty singularly unappealing, I think, especially in the American market. But, you know, as a, as a demonstration of technology, I think it's kind of fun. And, you know, maybe they're just being careful to set expectations that, you know, we're not ready to put this technology into a mainstream car today. Hmm. Hmm. Do you think, I mean, it, it, for those who haven't seen the car, it's about the size of a smart car, isn't it? it that's what it looks like. I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen one in person, but yeah, it looks like you can fit four small people in it just barely. I think it's two, actually. I think it's two, two people, in, in, certainly in the prototype. 
Ah. Um, and unlike other self-driving cars, it doesn't have any control surfaces. So you, there's no steering wheel, no pedals. <laughs> from, a user, from a user perspective, how do we think that's going to be met? Yeah, you know, I think if I'm going to have my car drive me to work, I want to stretch out and read the newspaper. I don't want to be cramped in this little tiny box. So, Would you trust it? Uh, I, I, could, I can imagine trusting robotic driving. Right. Obviously, I'm not going to say that I'm going to trust the, uh, the, that vehicle Particular today. Vehicle. Right. But, uh, you know, this technology has been around for a while. We started seeing it with the DARPA Grand Challenge 10 years ago. And, yeah, so uh, we're going to get there someday. And it's going to be awesome because it's going to make cars safer. But, but yeah, I think it's going to take a while. Now, John, this particular vehicle is never intended for production. They're going to make 100 of them. Uh, Google said, okay, if if it proves popular, we might license the technology out to an automaker. I, I'm really struggling to see where Google fits in with this. Perhaps you can help me. Uh, Google is a technology company, and as, as you pointed out, they seed lots and lots and lots of technology projects, in part because they are very conscious that many uh, <clears throat> notable electronics and Silicon Valley companies um, do one thing really well, um, ride a soaring curve, and then sort of decline forever and then die or get bought. And Google wants to stick around. So they're trying to figure out, right, if in fact internet search at some point is a decaying business, what do we supplement it with? Um, and this is one of dozens, if not hundreds, of sort of um, Skunk Works projects. This one's become uh, longer lived, and more public for obvious reasons, and it attracts the public's attention as well. But um, I'm not convinced the automakers particularly trust or want to work with Google. Um, but to your earlier question about would this be popular, I think we all need to take a step back. All of us are of a specific generation of people who view cars in a very particular mind frame. Right. We're all Western world. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that politically, but, you know, we're, we're all from European and North American countries. Right. Um, and North America in particular has developed for the last 70 years on the principle of suburbanization and separation of residences and industry and commercial. And you have to drive amongst those things right. for large numbers of people. By the time fully robotic autonomous vehicles arrive, um, the Chinese market will be even more important than it is now. Um, it will be continuing to attract those people who've never owned a car before. And a lot of the cultural research seems to indicate that interest in driving in and of itself as a process, even amongst North American, European, and Asian teenagers, is declining. Um, you know, cars used to be, and my friends in Detroit still often view them, as freedom. Cars are the thing that let you go out and become who you are and so on. These days, oh, I don't have my phone with me. I took it away so it didn't make noises, but this is where I wave my phone and say, this is what freedom is to future consumers. Cars are appliances like toasters. And if you look at the Google autonomous car 20 years hence as a transportation appliance mm -hmm. where you use mm -hmm. the appliance to get you from point A to point B, You'd much rather spend your time doing something else oh, yes. than actually conducting it. Imagine if you had to hold the bread down in your toaster, right? <laughs> yes, that's a very good analogy, actually. And it ties in very nicely, John, with, it, with an article I think I read on, on Green Car Reports this week that says that uh, a lot of younger uh, consumers, just they're not viewing cars in the same way that Generation X and Generation Y did. And millennials do view cars as much more of a tool than an extension of self. I mean, we grew up, didn't we, with with the idea of cars being an extension of self. You buy a car that reflects your personality. You put hours of blood, sweat, and tears into it, especially if you're of a generation that British learned car how nerds. cars worked. <laughs> and 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 cars are no longer an extension of self by by millennials. The iPhone, the, the 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 gear, whatever the gadget happens to be of choice, that's the extension of self. More importantly, ownership of objects and devices as opposed to renting them is not seen as important. 
mm-hmm. look at the rise of Uber. Yes. You know, I know, rather to my shock, I know a number of people who have essentially replaced ownership of a personal car with selective use of Uber and carpooling. Hmm. Doesn't work if you're out in the far dispersed suburbs of Detroit, mm-hmm. but in more built up urban areas, especially those that supposedly the new newer generation likes to live in, whether they stay there with kids, we'll see. And certainly in the mega cities of the future, um, borrowing, renting, or otherwise point to point using the services of a large, heavy, complex electromechanical thing that should then go away again and exit your life yeah. is going to be much more common than the ownership model today. Because remember, the average auto in the U.S. sits 23 hours, plus or minus, dead and cold, and yes. only gets used for one hour a day. That's a huge misallocation of resources. And, and of, yeah, it is. And, and actually, that ties really nicely in with the what you were saying earlier on about the autonomous driving parking itself, uh, which ties in very nicely with our next story, which is CES 2015 kicks off next week. Uh, and we're going to see a lot of autonomous driving technologies demonstrated there, Tom. Um, do we think that, 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 that CES is the place to go for, for, for gadget laden cars these days? And, and do we think that anything demonstrated there will actually find purchase in the autonomous, in, in the vehicle world or the green vehicle world or the autonomous drive world? Or is it just a showy place? Yeah, it's been a few years since I've uh, been to CES myself, but it does seem like that's where a lot of pretty exciting things debut and also the signal of what's going mainstream. So yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be very interesting to see what, what shows up there this year. But it's not a public show, is it? It's a trade show. Uh, that's right. Although civilians can find a way to get in. <laughs> and it's a pretty huge trade show. Yeah, yeah. And and it's going to, I mean, Ford, Ford were one of the first car makers to really focus on CES. Uh, five years ago now, John, I think they, they made their first. Yeah, and it was, really, it was really a matter of, of sort of um, CES having a huge decline in attendance at the show uh, as a result of the economic recession and sort of casting around for something that would be new and different and asking Ford, do you want to come to the show? We'll make you the keynoter. And Ford saw a good venue that just preceded the Detroit Auto Show and has had it several times since then. I've heard rumors, actually, that CES is thinking about doing its own auto show because they're rather heard that autos have become such a piece of the news cycle for their show, but that's a different story. All right. We're going to zip through these last ones pretty quickly. Um, But uh, obviously we mentioned earlier on in the show that the 2016 Chevy Volt is going to be unveiled in a week's time. Uh, at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit. But does this mean now that we should be advising people to buy first-generation Volts at discount? Tom, now, to, uh, we, were, we were hearing from John earlier on in the show that there are now some dealers really heavily discounting Volts uh, before incentives. Would you inv- advise anybody to go out and buy a Volt if they were in the, in the marketplace for a plug-in car, if they could get one cheaply? Oh, absolutely. I love the Volt, especially for a single, single car household. I, I, you know, I would not put a leaf in a single car household, but uh, uh, Volt is an awesome car, definitely. And John, I mean, do you have anything to add to that? You, you obviously have spent uh, some considerable time with the first generation Volt um, and lots of uh, readers at Green Car Reports love it. What Tom said. What Tom said, and I, I, I've got to agree. Um, as a as a Volt driver myself, I do like the Volt. Um, uh, slightly different kettle of fish in the UK because it's no longer produced uh, and sold in the UK. But uh, if you are in the states and you're looking for a good bargain and you don't mind the the uh, fairly limited range of the current generation Volt, and I say limited, I mean thirty miles is is doable. I've I've got more than fifty out of it with careful driving. Uh, I would say it's one of the plug-in cars that you can extend the most in terms of range compared to say the Leaf or other cars. Um, but okay, this brings us to our penultimate story. Elon Musk has been tweeting like a like a boss all over the Christmas and New Year period. Um, and of late, Mr. Musk's tweets have been getting a little bit, uh, how should we put this politely, John? Futuristic. Futuristic, thank you. He's warned us about the dangers of 
robotics and artificial intelligence uh, of you, which is shared by Professor Stephen Hawking. So he's not the only very, very uh, high profile intelligent person to be commenting along those lines. But on, I think it was New Year's Day, he tweeted that we'll be seeing a robotic charger for the Tesla Model S, which will come out and plug the car in for you. Which brings <laughs> me to the question, is he a genius uh, who is uh, insanely uh, an insane genius, or is he just a genius who's a bit insane, John? Yes. Yes. <laughs> there is a fine line, isn't there? It, I, I'm wondering if this is really a problem that needs to be solved. If we look at Tesla's history, um, Things often get previewed by tweets, and then there's a large flashy demonstration, and then they arrive a few months later than they were originally uh, announced to arrive. You know, Tom, you can talk about how challenging it is for you, your better <laughs> half, of your family to plug in an electric car. I'm sort of not seeing this, especially since the rest of the industry seems to think that inductive charging with cars that position themselves over the charger is the way to go. I, to me, this is a bit of a sideshow, but like anything <laughs> Elon tweets, it gets lots of attention. Yes, it does, and and it's it is a bit it is a bit crazy. Tom, what do you what are your quick thoughts on that one? Well, I will admit the roadster connector is kind of a nuisance to work with, <laughs> but uh, but plugging the J connector into a leaf or, or the Model S connector is so nice. <sighs> you keep hearing this from people though, saying, "Oh, I have to plug it in." I, you know, I wonder if he's just <laughs> mocking people who think that plugging in's a big deal. So. I think it has to be. It has to be just an April Fool. All right, we're going to go to our and finally. I'm going to show you this very quickly. It is 2015, uh, and as fans of Back to the Future will tell you, it's the year that we are going to see Mr. Fusion, flying cars, hoverboards, lace up shoes, and Ronald <laughs> Reagan in a retro themed bar or, 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 or smoothie shop. Uh, but this was spotted earlier on this year. A hover car. It's actually, it was last year. It was spotted last year. It's a hover DeLorean, which I'm not sure if that is classed as evolved transport or not. <laughs> One word answers, if you please, gentlemen. Do we give it the yes or the no, John? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom? Uh, what John said. <laughs> and to everybody watching at home as well. I wish you all, uh, I hope you've had a very happy new year. Thanks for joining us. I do apologise if there's been a few troubles with the stream today. We're trying Google Hangouts for the first time. Obviously, it's not working. We've we've had some complaints that it's choppy and whatnot, but we are recording locally, so hopefully that will solve the problem. So with that, I'm going to head off to an edit suite. And as always, folks, thanks for joining us. And don't forget to plug in. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.